Hey friends, back here with another episode of how they started their tech career. Today we have an AWS community builder who is a principal engineer at Design and also the creator of Open Up the Cloud, by which he's trying to help people get their start in cloud software engineering. I know it's been a long time since we did, released an episode um, for how they started their tech career, but here we are. Please welcome Lou. So before we dive into the episode, why don't you take it for a short introduction? Yeah, sure. So my name is Lou, and uh, so I currently work as a principal engineer for the Zone uh, for our developer experience team. But I think probably maybe people know me more for sort of lurking about in the different cloud communities and stuff like that. Um, so I run uh, well. It's hard to define it. So I run sort of a blog and a YouTube channel and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. under the name open up the cloud so open up the cloud .com. Yeah. um and i've been doing that for for quite some time and kind of all over the different social media and stuff like that um all the different cloud space and yeah sort of over the last few years it's kind of snowballed i kind of started talking and writing about the cloud a little bit more and over time um things have just like kind of just kept steam and i kind of just kept answering people's questions and kind of getting more into the community and stuff like that and um yeah and we kind of are where we are now um probably the the website and, and writing has always been uh kind of a staple of sort of the thing i've been doing in the past and probably still to this day is probably the biggest part of um what i do but um even in this last year just getting into youtube as well um has been quite interesting as well because i've it's mostly been an experiment and i didn't share it uh with <laughs> a lot of people people start stumbling across it and i'm like okay <laughs> i should probably yeah. start sharing this out a bit more a bit more broadly because uh I, I don't know about you but i sort of went into it a little bit bashful and a little bit shy about um you know trying to get my my head around how everything works and there's so much to, to kind of understand in the youtube world it's uh you never really know when when stuff feels like sort of good enough to share um, yeah definitely yeah, definitely yeah. and i think yeah, yes um, i've been in this kind of same boat uh, with just like YouTube and stuff. Like I loved writing blogs because you you don't have to face a camera and you just write what knowledge you have or what idea you have. Whereas in, in the video format, it's really hard to present it in a way that the user or your audience understands it. And on top of that, you need to be creative, right? So yeah, it's it's a journey for sure. But yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's how we met, like you just being active in multiple cloud communities and being active on Twitter. I came across a few of your blog posts and yeah, I think that's when we connected and just started like sharing each other's content. But yeah, no, it's been, it's been, when I look at it, it's been crazy because you do work full time as the principal software engineer, and then you also have open up the cloud. And then you're also doing YouTube and other community related stuff. So, so how do you like manage your time um, <laughs> when it comes to, because we, we all also have our like personal lives and personal responsibilities. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. So, uh, bef well, before that, I can't really speak to how necessarily I did it before, but now I've kind of got a bit more serious about, it. um, the way that I've basically been doing it is I, I get up in the morning and spend a bit of time uh pretty much before work uh, most days i try and i try and get up before mo work most days to to kind of work on stuff for the last few weeks i've been i've been off so i haven't really been um uh, been doing that stuff for the last few weeks and uh, it's funny right because it kind of it, it plays on your mind a little bit but mm -hmm. um i think over time i've got a bit more mature about you know it's okay to, to take a little bit of time uh here and there but basically i try and just take a little bit of time before work a couple of hours really um you know, I might do some stuff in the evenings here and there, like if I'm doing a bit of reading or responding to people on Twitter and stuff like that, but that's not really, uh, it's not really scheduled in. And if I do or don't do that, it doesn't really matter. Um, but I have quite a, at this point, quite a structured sort of regime around what I do uh, in the mornings. And I kind of, um, in order to sort of I get, get a bit more productive around everything, I try to line stuff up so that I know exactly what I'm doing uh, mm -hmm. each day in the mornings. Um, I, I would say it certainly is a struggle um, sometimes with running so many different things to try and prioritize across them. Uh, but it, but it's interesting as well, right? Because I wanted to I wanted to get into the YouTube stuff because I wanted to 
I wanted to show my face. And I think that's important. I want people to yeah. see that, you know, uh, kind of a real person because the blog for a while kind of got a lot of traffic. And I feel like people mm -hmm. probably read a lot of my stuff, but people probably never even knew it was me that was behind it, even though you have your yeah. little author bio and stuff at the bottom. I feel like so many people must have read my work, but just never knew it was mm -hmm. me. And I feel like over the last six months or a year, I tried to sort of put my face on stuff a little bit more and kind of push the fact that it's me behind it. And that, that has made a huge difference, um, to be fair, from people in terms of, I think, just building trust behind some of the stuff that I'm that I'm doing and talking about, I guess, when people could see you and kind of relate sure. to you and stuff like that. Um, but no, I basically do a lot of it in basically in the mornings. I've had a few people a few times ask me if I'm doing stuff full time and I'm like, no, no, not at all. <laughs> um, some of the videos I did sort of on the weekends and stuff, but I tried to yep. as well condense that down. Um, mm -hmm. I did a few series as, um, that I did on the weekends, but I very deliberately wanted to make sure that it wasn't taking up loads of time. So I, I did some of those in sort of batches and some of those I even did like three or four different videos at the same time. So it was even just like sort of one, one weekend, one weekend day in a month, I would do some filming and then throughout the rest of the week in the mornings, I would do a bit of editing and stuff like that. And, Generally speaking, it doesn't actually take up too much time as a result of that. Maybe yeah. what other people would think. It's more of that just like constantly putting in maybe two or three hours before work every day. Um, and that all just nice. adds up, really. Yeah, I think that's, I believe, and this is, there are things that you learn by doing them over time. And I think that was one thing that I was doing wrong before was I usually kept like my side projects or videos or blog stuff for the, later in the day so like i would start my day with my work and then by the end of the day i would be so exhausted and down the path of like last year going like six seven months into like content just blogs tweets and videos i couldn't keep myself consistent because i would be like so tired or burned out just by doing work and i think now what i have built is you need to have a routine to stay consistent and like consistency is really important uh, especially like in this space and what i have learned is for me weekends work great because i can just relax and like focus and i'm way more productive than any of the like working days um and that's just me but yeah i guess like putting it in the mornings too is like a really good way because you're you just woke up you're fresh and you like have your creative juices running through your brains um but yeah no that's that's really good to know and yeah i think like people who are trying to get into the cont content creation world they, they get some tips from our conversation here and just to like dive a bit go back in time i, I would love to know like a bit of background when when you were like really young like were you into um tech at all or were you like geek like in, um, <laughs> into computers a yeah. lot or did it grow over you like as you uh, were getting older yeah so this is interesting so I, I saw your video about your story and it, it was great actually I haven't really put all out there about my own story so I really wanted to kind of copy or do something similar about that but I haven't talked about this a lot myself um I would say it's mixed. So I, I definitely wasn't, I've spoken to some people in tech sort of programmers and they're sort of saying, you know, when they were eight years old or something, they would get some small computer and they were like doing programming and things like that. And I, I feel like those people are, um, you know, are very lucky to kind of get exposure at that such an early mm -hmm. age, really. So, so I didn't, so I, I was always very interested in tech and, and that kind of thing when I was growing up and I kind of throughout school, like there was many different subjects that I enjoyed. Um, and it was actually quite a struggle to kind of pick something that I was kind of interested in. Um, so I ended up doing sort of a part computer science degree. The reason that I didn't do a full computer science degree, because at the time, um, I guess, because I hadn't had such a deep background, I didn't really know, I suppose if I would enjoy it. So what I did is I kind of spread bet, did sort of part, uh, I guess, like classical sort of business, or I guess what the Americans like MBA style kind of stuff as well. Mm -hmm. And then do the part like computer science. Um, but as time evolved and I could pick modules and courses and stuff in university, I ended up going more and more onto the computer science side. And okay. that's, I, I guess to me was uh, almost a bit more, bit of a regret really, if I could go back in time and actually have done sort of full computer science, I would love mm. to, because I miss, missed out on 
quite a lot of that experience. So whilst I have a computer science degree, so to speak, I missed out on a lot of those core modules because I was also doing stuff um, over on sort of the classical business side. Um, and I wish I wish I had the confidence really to kind of just go all in on that from the start. But I think I just had this sort of hesitancy um, around it. And yeah, so basically my first exposure to, let's say, to programming stuff came when I was about 18, which is actually in university. Um, mm -hmm. I'd seen other people program before. And I remember in school, I had one of my friends is actually, he was into app building and stuff like that. He was like, he's this crazy guy. Um, I have no idea how he taught himself or how he even got into it. But yep. uh, he was like one of the few guys in our school that was like into apps and stuff. And he was like, mm -hmm. you had these really quite successful apps for like quite a young guy. Um, and I remember always being really, being really sort of amazed by the stuff that he built. And I remember he sort of first showed us some CSS stuff when I was maybe, I don't know, 16, 17. And I was just like, my brain was melting. I thought this guy had like superpowers or something. Um, and yeah. I, I was just like, wow, that's incredible. I have no idea how he, how he learned that and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, I, I guess maybe some of those inspirations and stuff kind of led me down that path. And eventually over time, I kind of learned that, uh, it was something that I could do. Um, probably mm -hmm. for other people, maybe they jump straight into it, but it took me, a, I think a long time, a lot of sort of tentative steps. And this, this is a pattern that still plays out in my life. Now These sort of tentative steps, seeing if I like it. And then eventually you get the confidence after a while. Um, and just go, okay, cool. yeah, I, I, I can actually do this, which is funny yep. because I think people looking on the outside think that you've always had this confidence or you've always had this interest and no, no, like yeah. it, it, it takes a long time for that sort of to mature and for you to realize that you like it. So no, for sure. I think that's the one thing that I would like to point out is most of us have don't like figured it out until now too. Like, I, I don't know what I'll be doing in like five years or six years. Um, and the, the way I see it is you just got to try it out. Right. That's, that's only the way you'll know if you like it or not. And you have, you would have the confidence. Okay. Yeah. This is uh, like, I want to dive deep into this particular niche, even if it's not tech related. Right. Um, yeah. and I don't know how many people out there know that I was, I dropped out of university doing computer science just because I was like, I, I don't know if I want to do this. Um, and then <laughs> yeah, exactly. went back, uh, and instead of doing like a full four year degree, I'm like, I'll get something that's takes less time and also is cheaper. <laughs> so I did a two year diploma in net, like computer networking and I'm like, okay, yeah, this is what I want to do. Um, so yeah, you know, it takes multiple tries and you need to try out different things in order to build that confidence that, okay, yeah, this is what I want to do with my life. No, that is, yeah. that is really interesting. I, well, for me as well, I, I, so my first job I got as a placement year between my, uh, university studies. So after my second year, so I'd basically been programming bits and pieces within my university for two years, mm -hmm. I get my first job and. I remember it wasn't until maybe six months into that first job where I actually kind of had this moment where I was like, I actually enjoy this and I think that I can do it. Mm -hmm. So it took me a full two and a half years of actually doing it before that kind of like moment came where I had the confidence to continue. But like, that's a long time, I think, you know, I think that's probably yeah. a lot longer than other people would expect two and a half <laughs> years. Like, wow. Okay. Like you think you get that maybe a couple of months in or something, but no, no, not mm -hmm. necessarily. Yeah, I think that really takes us into like a really good segue here um, towards the question, like what was your first tech job and like how did you end up there or how did you get it? What different things you did to like get into tech? Yeah, so w around the time that I was uh, thinking about going and doing my degree, I, whilst I'm an academic kind of person, I also, I was really itching to start work. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for whatever, for whatever reason, I really just wanted to get into the workplace. So we have this off sort of way that it's set up in the UK. I don't know how it works elsewhere, but they kind of encourage you sometimes to do a placement. So between your university, so between second and third year, they yep. sort of encourage you to do a year out and, uh, go out into the industry and, and get a job and, and get started. And 
yeah, it uh, it was a struggle that that first job. Um, the you start applying at the start of your second year, and then obviously around summertime when the end of the second year, hopefully you've got things uh, all lined up. And yeah, that was a that was a struggle because I watched other people, the classmates or the friends, they all landed placements very early, like September, mm -hmm. October time, which is like the start of the of our academic year. And it, it took me forever. Um, it took me. I, I, I think I got through by like two or three days in the end, because what happened is, uh, so I, I used to work in the, in the US as well, you know, in, in the summer camps over the summer. And I spent an entire year applying and getting rejected, applying and getting rejected this entire year. And I had this conversation with my dad around sort of May time the following year. So it'd been about nine months. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I said, I don't, I don't know what I want to do right now because I can stay at home this summer and keep applying and hope that by September that I have something. Otherwise I have to go back basically and do my final year, but mm -hmm. I had to make a, a sort of decision. And I was like, I, I've had terrible luck. I cannot find anything whatsoever. Um, what, what, you know, what, 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 what should I do? You know, we had this mm -hmm. conversation and I actually made the decision that I, I was, I basically gave up on it and said, you know what, I'll tell my university, I'm going back to do my final year. I've tried, you know, I've done so many interviews that, that I can't do it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just couldn't make it work and I'll, I'll go back and do my final year. And funnily enough, so I went away, I worked the summer and right at the end of the summer, like September time, maybe two weeks or something to go, I had like a remote interview with this, this one company, uh, who then just took a shot on me, uh, gave me nice. the, the job as like a junior, um, which is crazy because. I was there, you know, basically spending a little bit of money that I'd earned to do, you know, go around and see a few places. And I was meant to be going back to do my final year, like two weeks time. And this mm -hmm. came in this job, um, working with this company, the based in London, uh, which then started off a whole journey going down and worked in London for ever since then, actually for the next sort of eight years or so. Um, nice. and that was basically was in, was in web development. I was applying for absolutely everything at the time, mm -hmm. pretty much any, you know, as, as as desperation set in towards the end, I was applied for, for pretty much anything. Um, and they hired me basically as a web developer and I just kind of got into that. I started doing some sort of JavaScript stuff, some front end stuff, some back end stuff, and, uh, everything kind of snowballed from there. But I suppose for me as well, that kind of first job step happened mm -hmm. twice because I had the placement for a year. But then I had to go back to my final year and then I had to go back and kind of apply for a job after it. Now, of course, I had that year of uh, yep. experience, but actually that was that was really useful because the second time around, like the way that I approached everything was like completely different just from having um, some of those insights from that first year go round. Um, yeah. and to, I, can, I can dig into that as well because I feel like there was some very specific things that I did that made my whole life so much easier the second time around that maybe I, I probably didn't. No, do for sure. Yeah. Let's, around. let's dive um, into that because I think it'll, there will be like a lot of students and professional that are in like same, same situation right now. Yeah. Yeah. Cause so basically what, what I did at the time, and it's something that I continue to recommend really was, uh, because I started to see into the industry and I think that you can do this, even if you're not if you didn't have the experience that I had by working is finding basically like a specific, very specific tech stack. So, mm. I mean, at the time it was, um, it was like the mean stack, which has evolved and changed and stuff like that, which was Mongo express, uh, angular and node. Yep. Um, and what was really interesting about that specific tech stack at the time is it was really hot and companies just wanted you to know those skills, to be honest. And mm -hmm. if you were good at those, they would hire you pretty much. Um, so what I did was I sort of spent my final year, you know, even in probably I sat there in modules that I was probably supposed to be listening in and stuff like that. And I was basically building, uh, just this one big project that I was going to build for my final year in this specific tech stack. But what I did is I just sort of, you know, mm -hmm. I was like, this is the tech stack that I'm going to learn. I'm going to nail this. I'm going to learn yep. it inside out. Um, so that's kind of what I did with that insight, then using that to get in and it was, it was funny. It worked perfectly. It was, it, uh, it was like a dream uh, to the, when I actually then got the subsequent job, it was funny because I'd spent that entire year learning what at the time was like AngularJS, which is, you know, uh, about eight years ago, it had just come out and 
there was no one on the market that knew it. And here I was this graduate, I just graduated. And basically I, I knew more than pretty much anyone on the market because I had that unique chance to spend a year really digging into it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that pattern can still be applied today, you know, taking something that maybe has come out maybe one or two years ago yeah. where people in, people in industry, they don't have the time to study it like I did, or like maybe you do, if you, you know, if you're taking that time in the mornings or in the evenings to learn. And yep. I think that might surprise people because then when I got in, my bosses at the time were like almost dumbfounded. They were like, we don't get it. How you know this so well, like better than some of the other engineers mm. that we have that like, we've got engineers here with 10 years of experience, but you seem to be more productive. Mm -hmm. How is this even possible? Like you're, you're a junior, Yeah, this shouldn't be possible. But that was because I'd spent so long reading docs and just like immersing myself in that one technology. I watched every video that was on YouTube. I watched you know, <laughs> watched sure. everything, read everything. <laughs> so I think that that made a huge difference in that second time round. And it was so much easier. Um, no, uh, yeah, I think, yeah. So it kind of like you got some exposure uh, working at that placement, I guess, and then. Um, you just kind of saw what industry is moving forward to and what they'll look into uh, like in in the near future and you executed like a really good plan on okay I'll, I'll name this one one technology that will be or you weren't obviously like you had a bit of idea that will be adopted in the industry itself which helped you land the role and that's the thing that I I also point out to people who are really like starting out their career. And I think I can reflect back on my journey too, is I didn't know what cloud was. Um, and I was working in help desk and then someone introduced me to cloud while I was on my placement. And that's when I was like, okay, um, if I'm going back and like, if I have some time left, I'm just going to focus on AWS is the one that I chose and I like nailed it down even though after that I got a job offer that was still like tech support. I'm like, fine, I'll yeah. take it because they were using AWS. I knew that. And then later um, when there was a job opening in the cloud team, it was easy for me to transition to that role, obviously because I was like an internal employee. But apart from that, if I hadn't that, like if I hadn't had that insight, I would have <laughs> um, still be lost, I guess, uh, trying out different things. But yeah, I think um, it's a really good tip on like picking picking one technology and like just immersing yourself into it will get you a long way um, rather than just like picking and trying this for like a month and then picking another technology, trying that for a month. Um, and yeah, no, that is a great tip. Yeah, and that that's one of the things that I see that a lot of people struggling with. Um, Especially so now, now I'm kind of like completely immersed in, in sort of the cloud community and, and people obviously always asking me questions and stuff. And I think that that is, that's probably one of the biggest things I think I see people trip up on, um, especially mm -hmm. in the cloud space as well, is focusing on such a sort of like a sort of broad range of skills that don't really make sense. Like some of the, the things that people tell me that they're, they're learning is like baffling. It's, this is going to take you years to learn these things. And there's just a random collection of, you know, I, I don't know, but I want to learn a bit of Java and C++ and a bit of Azure and a bit of AWS, yeah. and some Kubernetes. And I'm like, have you got like 10 years or something? Because like, <laughs> it's going to take ages. Um, For sure. So, and that's that, even when I talk to people, I can, I can see that they, they struggle with that. They don't want to, to let go of some of these because they've obviously got their heart set on learning various different bits and pieces. But mm -hmm. I don't know if, you know, once the, when you, when you're trying to apply, you're trying to actually get through that hurdle. I think it kind of just focuses stuff and, you know, when you're running out of time and the pressure's on, like, then you've got to just narrow it down, decide, okay, what's, what's the better strategy for this? Cause yeah. otherwise you'll just spend forever just trapped learning random stuff and, mm -hmm you know, never go over that that first hurdle, I think. Yeah. And I think I've I like, I, I've been there personally, um, when they, I saw like, oh, JavaScript is the new, like, <laughs> go-to language, especially with Twitter, right? You, you see all these amazing threads and tweets. Oh, no, you should learn Python. And I, like, I was, and I'm not 
I don't consider myself a developer uh, just because I haven't gone down that rabbit hole. And also that's not what I've like studied uh, for. Like I haven't spent my time there. And that's why I like keep shuffling between languages, which kept me away from like actually understanding one and like mastering one. Um, because the most important thing I found out is the concepts itself, because then you can just transfer them to whatever language you want to use. Um, but that's what I have struggled in the past and yeah, no, that, that is a good tip, uh, for anyone who is starting out and seeing all these cool buzzwords uh, on job postings or on tweets or whatever other social media platform you're using is to like pick one, which you think looks more, most interesting to you. And then just choose that, um, immerse into that for like a year or so and see where it gets you. No, that is, yeah. that is a really mm. good tip. I, I don't know about you as well, but I certainly have, it's very rare that I come across someone that makes a decision that I think is a bad decision. It's very mm. rarely that someone comes and says, I want to learn this language. And I'm saying, no, that's a terrible idea. Cause no one's suggesting me to learn like some really old languages or Perl or COBOL or something like that. No, no one ever suggests that. Yeah. It's like the problem, the problem is not, yeah, the problem is not the decision. The problem is just committing to one and sticking mm -hmm. with it. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, the, People come to you like Golang is, is that good or Python mm. or whatever, and it's like, ah, like they're all good, you know. Yeah. I have opinions, but it all works. Like you know, very rarely does. If, in fact, I can't even think of it one time someone came to me and I was like, "Nah, that's a hideous decision. Don't do that." I I can't mm -hmm. remember ever saying that in certainly not in in recent memory yeah. anyway. No, that is very good. Um, yeah, I think that's most of the time that's my answer too because. People usually come to me and ask which cloud to pick. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. they're they're all the same. Um, they all do the same thing. Um, so yeah, just like search. If you can't make a decision, search through your job market or the cities that you're looking at. See which one is the most adoptable, or which, like, what companies are choosing as their cloud provider, and pick that, so that it's easy to get a job. Um, but yeah, I have never said, okay, yeah, don't pick Azure because this and that, or don't pick AWS. Um, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so um, I know you mentioned you did a bachelor's in information management and computing, and you have yes, some. Yeah, that's the actual title. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I see. You, you said you had some concerns in regards to if you could go back in time, you wanted to be like completely doing computer science degree. Yeah. Um, so was that, is that, I know that there have been norms, like in, especially in India too, uh, you need to get your bachelor's degree, which is not the case in, especially in like North America here in the US and Canada, I guess, because things are getting easier for people to enter the tech space. Uh, even yeah. if you don't have a degree, but how is how is the scene in like Europe or UK now? Um, it's a tough one because I don't have the the data to hand. I certainly have mm -hmm. sort of anecdotal. Um, I I really don't think it matters a lot because okay. it's crazy because the because the job market is tough. It's really tough right yeah. now anyway for employers. It's really hard mm -hmm. for them to find people. I would really be surprised, let's say, if they were knocking people back or rejecting people because they didn't have degrees. I think that that would be kind of crazy if you had a genuinely good candidate or a genuinely good CV come through mm -hmm. and they don't have some sort of degree on there. I, maybe some employers do, but so many other employers are going to be willing to take you because the market is, you know, the, yeah. there, there's a huge demand and not a lot of supply, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, it is, but as well, like obviously I, I had one, so that kind of um, mattered through that. But when, when I've been involved, let's say in hiring processes for other companies, no, Amazing. it's never been, it's never been, it's never been relevant to me. Certainly not something that I ever um, mm -hmm. particularly look for. Maybe let's say if you're a company and you have a lot of CVs come through potentially mm. in that case, right? Like you might, you have to Use sit on something. Filter, yeah. They have to, yeah, they have to filter on something. So in that case, maybe some companies will, um, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, only a handful of companies, to be honest, only the, the popular ones or some of the, the bigger companies are going to be having uh, inundated with CVs. I think a lot of other companies struggle. There's a lot of other small to medium sized companies um, 
which is something that I recommend to people as well is go find small and medium sized companies because they struggle yeah. with getting, you know, their job adverts out there. So they're going to have less CVs through the door. So stuff like degrees and stuff is going to matter less to them than it is to some of the big tech companies. But um, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I, I want to say that it really doesn't matter that much at all. I have heard stories of some people saying that they've been rejected based on that ground. So I'm a little bit hesitant to, to be fully, um, sort of confident yeah. that it doesn't matter at all but i i certainly wouldn't be I, w I wouldn't be bothered if i was entering the market at this point in time and not getting a degree to be honest i, w I wouldn't sweat it at all um yeah no oh, that's yeah i think yeah it's it's pretty same here too um especially like not even now like back in i think 2017 if you go back when i i was looking for jobs um to some extent, like you, you brought up a good point of big tech companies. Yeah, they they would because they're receiving like thousands or two thousand more than that applications for even one job posting. They need some grounds to filter um, so many applications. Um, whereas like big or sorry mid size or small companies, they they don't look for that, uh, especially because there there are not too many applicants, right? And if you if you have the basic knowledge that most likely you'll be called on an interview and then things go from there. No, that is, yeah, I think it's pretty same <laughs> to what we have here. Um, and how, what about like your, so your, I see you have worked, uh, quite at quite a few companies and just wanted to see like how, how your journey in tech has been so far. Does it ever got like rough uh in between some years uh i am definitely sure you might have had some bad experiences and some really good experiences so like do you want to do you have some that you want to share uh <laughs> of course uh, do you mean sort of like war stories for or, yeah, or do yeah. you just want to know kind of like my sort of trajectory or path through as well um um because yeah, actually that's, that's... I, start with the path and then no. <laughs> yeah we can certainly talk about war stories as well um yeah, yeah so i mean i so i i worked in this for this first job uh that i had for a year and they actually made me an offer to go back um which mm -hmm. is great but i didn't accept it for for various reasons i wanted to try uh different companies uh i, I can't remember why I, why i felt like that too much at the time i probably just thought let's let's go and see something new um mm -hmm. which is precisely what i did um, and then worked for another startup at the time. And to be honest, even at this point, I still really enjoy working at startups. Um, let's say companies below sort of, when I say startup, I mean more like sort of 40, 50 people and, and, and smaller. Yep. And, you know, the company that I work for now at his own, uh, you could maybe call them a startup, but they're huge. You know, we have thousands of mm. people. Um, mm -hmm. But like on the smaller side, it's usually what I kind of enjoy. And, um, and yeah, I suppose it's interesting, right? Because throughout your career, there there's no rule book about when to jump, when to leave, when to change jobs and stuff like that. It's something that's a very personal decision. And for sure, every time when I've sort of made a decision, there's definitely been some people that maybe thought it was a bad decision or tried to convince me not to do it. Um, yeah. And you just have to work out for yourself, <laughs> like what the pros and cons are, what the risks are and kind mm -hmm. of, yeah, there, there is no rule book. And even now actually I'm, I'm changing jobs even next week. So I've kind of been through this process again. Uh, mm -hmm. quite recently, uh, which is, which is interesting. So I worked for them for a startup and, um, from, from there, basically I had this itch to kind of go and see a lot more companies. So I actually then moved into kind of like an agency consultancy for, for a couple of years after that. And that was great because what I wanted to see there, I wanted to see a whole different range of companies. I wanted to see how they were doing stuff, were they doing stuff differently? And I think a lot of people maybe have this idea of like, like maybe there's some magic or some secret sauce that some companies mm -hmm. are doing that you haven't seen and you want to see it. Um, so I kind of got exposed to a lot of different companies, you know, some like uh, some big sort of e-commerce companies here. And um, I worked as well in some government departments and a lot of different like, a, a, and even like a finance startup and stuff like that. So a real sort of mix nice. of different companies. And yep. that was quite liberating because it, it kind of made me realize that there isn't a secret source as such. Like the, mm -hmm. I'd never saw anything. I've seen cool stuff in different places and different companies have done things in, in nice ways, but 
I don't think I ever came across anything like, oh my God, this company is doing something so different to what I've ever mm-hmm. done before. I don't know what, I don't know. It's just a hang up. And I think a lot of people have that. I have a friend that I've been chatting to recently, got a job um, more recently. And he was, yeah, he was asking about grad schemes. He was like, um, you know, should I go do a grad scheme or a regular job? Because mm. I feel like a grad scheme will show me different things. And I feel like he's going through that same mental process, which is, there's got to be something out there, this secret sauce, this magic you know, other companies are doing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I, I then worked for that agency for quite some time. And right at the end of that time is when I was working for this, this sort of finance startup. And uh, that's actually the beginning of where my sort of introduction into the sort of cloud stuff um, kind of took mm-hmm. off. Because, yeah, even my first job, I was basically exposed to the cloud. I was working in AWS from in, in my placement I talked about, which is yep. nearly I guess like nearly 10 years ago, something like that now. Mm-hmm. Um, this is back when AWS had like, I don't know, was had like 10 services. It must've been so simple. I thought it was so complicated at the time. <laughs> it must have been very straightforward. Um, yeah, and I, what, I, the stuff that we were with this finance startup, I just, I just really enjoyed it. We were building sort of some Node.js microservices and we were very close to, to AWS and the cloud and, and things like that. And I kind of just, when I was going, working for that particular client, I was like, mm-hmm. I, I want to do more of this. I really enjoy this. And the nature of the sort of agency consultancy business is you're going to move and get pushed about between clients. And at that point, I sort of made the decision. I said, I, I've seen enough. I've seen enough clients. I've seen enough companies. I want to continue doing this particular tech stack. Um, and that's when I sort of made made a change and and shifted then to working for the zone and trying to get more sort of into the nice. cloud and um, work closer with AWS and stuff and stuff like that as well, which yeah which obviously then happened quite a lot as well which is great um, mm-hmm. and yeah i think um for me as well I've, I've reflected on this a bit and i think around the sort of serverless revolution time to be honest is when i really became quite interested in in cloud stuff um i think that that that's the point in cloud history where i think the cloud became something different um mm, before serverless i think yeah, yeah. It felt like cloud was just shifting data center stuff onto the cloud, and there was mm-hmm. yeah, as benefits, but it was kind of as a software engineer, yeah, whatever. I don't care if my stuff runs on a server that we own or we don't yeah. own. That's like a business thing that, from a software development now, I, I don't really mind. Um, but when the serverless sort of uh, stuff came out, mm-hmm. it was a whole different ball game. It opened this this whole sort of world of opportunity of like just new things that you could do that you couldn't do before, and I was like. Okay, I'm in yeah. for this. I want to ride mm-hmm. this wave. And I suppose that's like the recognizing that sort of mean stack early on. It's kind of mm-hmm. like a more advanced version of that, right? Where you're like, okay, I want to choose a new sort of tech stack or a specialty. And I want to go into that. Yeah. Even, no. uh, even at a latest, later point in my career where I'm like, cool, cloud. I want to, you know, cloud and AWS and, you know, serverless and stuff like that. I want that to be, that's my new mean stack. That's my new focus. That's my new, like, I'm going to, uh, spend a lot of time mm-hmm. looking into this. So For yeah, sure. that's kind of the picking my way through the different companies to get to, to kind of where I am at the moment. And I'm about to make another switch as well uh, and go in a, in, a, in a different direction, <laughs> in, a oh, direction okay. in, a, in a week's time. So nice. Yeah. yeah so I guess, um, yeah. So look out for Lou's <laughs> update <laughs> um, when he <laughs> makes, that, makes that change. Um, but yeah, no, that is that is a really interesting, I would say, career progression from um, getting a degree in management and then also computer information and then going towards like doing your placements, figuring out what was like the hot topic that was going to be in the industry, being mean stack, and then picking on the wave that cloud brought into the tech industry, I think is, I, I think we use a term called like early adopters. Um, and I think that that helps you a lot, especially like it gives you that opportunity to be employable in the longer run. Um, but yeah, I think cloud is here to stay. Uh, so no kudos to you on that. And I also see a really interesting, um, company on your LinkedIn, it's Splito. So you, I think you, (laughs) you kind of founded it with your, some old friends and colleagues to like manage 
Bill Payton. Yeah, was yeah, that, that that was an interesting journey. I mean, to be fair, it's kind of um, kind of like we we've sort of halted stuff at the moment, and um, we're trying to figure out sort of the next step for it and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Largely, I mean, Splitu was a bit of a sort of almost like a very large sort of side project that we started maybe a couple of years ago. Um, Thanks. Uh, that we're, we, it's kind of on pause for the moment, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, we kind of learned a lot, I suppose, throughout that, uh, throughout that journey is sort of me and some, some old colleagues and, um, and some other friends kind of put that together and had a play, you know, putting together sort of a, a SaaS app and kind of going through that journey of trying to put things together. The, the thing that we struggled with largely with that, um, the app in general actually was trying to find sort of a, a product market mm. fit. Um, mm -hmm. We we got sort of a lot of attention and we got a lot of signups and stuff, but we we struggled sort of converting customers and things. And um, eventually, at some point, we kind of decided to take a step back and could we could we take the the sort of products in different directions and, and things like that. And that's kind of where where we're at now. Whether we want to take some of the the technology and ideas and kind of take it in a different direction. Um, and and yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that, I, throughout my time, actually, I've built quite a few um, different sort of smaller sort of SaaS uh, sort mm -hmm. of products playing around with. Around that time, actually, I was juggling across quite a few. I had three different projects running at the time. One was my own, one was this with two, and one with another friend as well. And I kind of had to, <laughs> had to shut some down to kind of double down in different places. Um, but no, I, I mean, I was doing that actually just just mainly for the fun, just to play about with technologies mm -hmm. and to use them uh, sort of in anger, um, like actually use them in, in sort of real scenarios and things like that. that that's that been sort of a uh, quite a big use, actually, because then you can play play with tech on your own. I think, yeah, if you work for a lot of big companies, sometimes a lot of these different pieces of the puzzle are solved for you. Um, mm -hmm. So I had this sort of curiosity, like I want to build everything, like, I don't want any bit to be done by someone else. I want to learn every different bit and piece of how everything fits together. Um, so that was kind of the curiosity behind behind doing some of that. And uh, yeah, Splatoon was an interesting one because it um, it largely was like a skin around um, behind like Stripe and the Stripe APIs and stuff like that, which to this day as well is still one of my favorite um, SaaS products. It's incredible. Uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. get nearly as much attention as it deserves in the industry, like yep. in terms of how many companies like Stripe is like powering behind the scenes. You hear, mm. you know, you hear about all the fang companies and stuff, but they're like sort of obviously because they're consumer products that people use. Yeah. Stripe is a behind the scenes type product so people don't mm -hmm. talk about it, but but like it's just this incredible company. And we were able to build this sort of payments processing platform on the back of some of the, the stuff within Stripe. And we sort of hacked yeah. around with some of their APIs and things and we did some stuff with their APIs that was quite funny. We would get on support with uh, with some of the Stripe people, and even they were like quite baffled at what we'd even managed to like architect on top of their their stuff. They were like, "No, nah, no, nah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to do that because what mm. we were essentially building is like a platform for platforms. We were building like a marketplace, um, yep. kind of like an Etsy or whatever. Where, yeah, it all got a bit complicated, but." Um, <laughs> It was around the time that they released their, it's like the Stripe Connect product, which is like mm. a super interesting, uh, super interesting product, which allows you to make basically marketplaces. So it's not just peer to peer payments. You have sort of intermediary companies that sell on your behalf, I guess, like eBay or Etsy and stuff. Nice. Um, and that's, that's a cool product. And yeah, one thing is the, it's, I'm, I'm always urging people to go take a look at Stripe as well. Like look at their docs and their products, even if you don't mm. care about payments, Yep. it's, it's an incredible company to just see like really great documentation and just a really neat product, some great APIs. Yeah, you can you can learn a lot just from poking around in in how Stripe have done stuff. It's very cool. Um, oh, for sure. No, that is big, pretty big interesting. Fan of that product. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah. Do Do you have any like horror stories from from working <laughs> with, like, trying to build Splito or any other horror stories that might interest us <laughs> yeah it's it's an interesting one i suppose we got like horror stories from like a people side or a tech side and <laughs> from every different side um <laughs> the yeah the, the sort of the one of the horror stories that kind of comes to my mind um every time we talk about well actually there's two so from the co first company that i ever worked for um two two come to mind actually because um 
let me start let me start with one of them so uh, around that time so we used to host stuff uh, as i said in in aws we used to have these ec2 images and mm -hmm. i remember some customer had uh sorry some customer had some issue and it was quite literally before our christmas party so it's christmas eve and everyone's sort of clearing up the office to to head out to this party yep. and like you know go get drunk and it was a small company so if everyone if anything happened like we were all going to be there like uh and before that the the cto clearly had like far too much faith in me because um he then asked me to do this sort of like production hot fix on these servers um uh, which I remember at the time was quite funny because there I am sort of SSHing into these different servers. I didn't understand about like the the sort of fingerprint thing that comes up where it's like uh, where you haven't logged in or on the yeah, sort of yeah. known host with SSH and like yes, no. I, I didn't even know what that was. Like I, I, I didn't even know. I was like just pressing buttons. So there I am in this production service, um, which is like quite a, quite an important um, product. It like mm -hmm. it was running for... I mean, I, I probably probably won't say at this point what it was under the scenes, but um, but yeah, and then I'm sort of sort of hot fixing, and you know, my palms are sort of sweating, like you know, hoping that I don't break anything, and I'm sort of like, cool, I get everything done, it's all clean, and um, and, you know, sort of get out of this thing, like, cool, so should we go or whatever, and start testing it, and as I'm refreshing the page, like the issue that I was seeing, like, is like coming back, like every now and again. Mm -hmm. So I remember sort of speaking to the CTO about this, and I'm like, "Oh, the issue's still there." And he's like, "Oh yeah, yeah. Like, have you done like all of the servers? It's low, it's load balanced." I'm mm -hmm. like, "Oh, are you kidding me?" <laughs> <laughs> so I was sat there like SSHing into all these different yeah, servers. Everyone knows them, this, yeah. this, in that particular scenario, nothing actually went wrong. But in hindsight, when I was reflecting back on that, I was like, "Oh my, like, yeah. don't do that. Um, don't give Junior." I think I had had I'd worked for like four months. Maybe six months, four months, something like this. You know, don't don't give your junior devs like SSH access to fraud. So, in, yeah, in, in, in that amount of time, like, yeah, a lot of what we were doing there was, yeah, it wasn't great. Like, ever since then, sort of the idea of like sort of a mutual, immutable infrastructure and trying to do mm, stuff in mm -hmm. like a scripted and controlled way. Ever since and that, and luckily I haven't been in that situation where I'm sort of hand modifying servers, which hopefully is less common nowadays than than in the yeah. past. But um, yeah, that was that was something special. <laughs> and uh, to be fair, at the same company in the same way as well, we used to have quite a big, um, quite a big like government client. And mm. the way that the app was architected, a lot of the style sheets as well were um, were stored in in this database. And I remember I was going in there trying to update them. It was really fiddly because you had to sort of copy paste style sheets out of a database and then edit them and then put them back into the database. Mm -hmm. And I remember at one point I, I must have basically accidentally deleted um this whole item in the database and i go back to okay. this government website and it just looks awful like it's unusable <laughs> <laughs> i like trashed it and just this like feeling of just like total dread i'm like oh my <laughs> and i think i'd saved a copy somewhere in my computer oh, okay. I where i managed to fish it out and like recover it eventually but like oh man yeah but, like i don't know for how <laughs> however long that took to recover that I'm thinking, oh, I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm done for. Like, I'm fired. I'm gone. Yeah. <laughs> this is a very important client. It's a very serious <laughs> website. Um, it's a big sort of government service. And... Yeah. To be honest, yeah. I've been there. Um, yeah. Deleting the wrong it's not fun. Um, files not fun. on database. <laughs> <laughs> I can laugh about it now. It wasn't funny at the time. Yeah. Yeah. It is um, not. Um, um, I had uh, the same feeling that like, I'm, I'm fired now. As soon as they find it out, <laughs> who did it? I'm fine. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's always it's always fun to look back at these. Um, yeah, so I guess you now that um, kind of covers up here, like the career side of things and like how you started towards how where you are kind of right now and how you were able to progress through like different different I want to say positions, but not not only positions, but your, yourself um, and how you transition towards from like being a mean expert or mean stack expert to like cloud now. Yeah. And I want you to know, like, I know there's a change coming soon, as you mentioned before, but like, what are yeah. you excited about for what's coming in the like near years? 
for, for light cloud specifically or anything that might have interested you like i don't know i know i've talked to a few people that are interested in iot and might transition towards that um yeah. there's web3 there's yep. always new things happening in ai ml and also there's ar vr world yeah that's still left to explore yeah i mean that's a great question i i don't think i necessarily have at this point some specific interest in in some of those at the moment i, I mean i'm pers from a personal standpoint still mm -hmm. continuing to just dig into into the cloud and as i mentioned before yep. i think if if i'm if i'm picking a specific area of the cloud that interests me the most it's it's sort of serverless development and, and i think that that has a, a long way to go um mm -hmm. there's a lot more sort of improvements and, and and knowledge and understanding that needs to come there i think that 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 sort of subsection of the cloud is um it's quite immature in some ways and and that's why i'm kind of interested in it and i think that it has a long way to go so yep. whilst the, there's other areas of the sort of machine learning and ai and yeah like web3 stuff or you know that kind of stuff is is certainly interesting but i yeah because i'm still there's still mm -hmm. so much to learn within like cloud and serverless and stuff like that that's still uh my particular sort of area of interest um kind of going forward and i don't really see that changing for the next mm -hmm. few years i suppose if if i saw something on the horizon like the skills i'm in was going to be defunct in the next sort of i don't know let's call it three years then i would be thinking about making a change but because that's just doesn't seem like the case whatsoever then you know that's just continues to i guess still sort of be my focus and um i i haven't been one i don't know about you but i certainly i don't think i've been one necessarily to chase specific trends and things i, I spent mm -hmm. a lot of my time trying to to go back actually and to address sort of fundamentals and gaps in my knowledge and things like that um so uh, you know, yeah kind of trying to build a better foundation especially when mm -hmm. i'm working with with other people or being in a more senior position it's trying to build that foundation because i want to have sort of knowledge of um knowledge of a lot of different areas because i think that that's useful especially in like a workplace context to to have that broad knowledge and i'm always very when i come across other engineers that are sort of knowledgeable in what i would say is like broad areas if i come across someone let's say that has like a deep knowledge of like linux or something like that i'm always mm -hmm. very impressed because like my linux is okay but like i come across people that are like super like they oh, they yeah. know everything um for sure and i'm just chasing that i guess that sort of trying to <laughs> trying to build this like the, as best as possible like a foundation across um sort of software engineering in general and like with a cloud focus but now i i'm not personally i guess like chasing any particular sort of specific trend in that in that regard um not right now anyway no that's that's good to know and i think you manage it way better than than me <laughs> in, in <laughs> i don't know not maybe in... i make you look like it <laughs> oh no no um like i see something at least what i do uh, so what i do right now is i study it up so like i will open a youtube video or a blog let's say i'm interested in web3 i would love to know what the technology itself is but i try to like keep myself away if i'm not interested but every yeah. now and then i have that feeling of like fomo <laughs> because yeah, there are yeah. so many great people tweeting about it and creating content around it and you're like oh maybe i'm missing on something um but yeah no i think over time i have gotten better at managing that and like staying like focused towards one niche um but i still have a lot to learn um but yeah no and i just have a quick quiz for you or like a rapid fire round um which is not <laughs> okay. not yeah it's not technical it's just just getting to know you better um in regards to what kind of like tech you use and what technologies you're interested in so sure. the first question is um what do you prefer um uh, in regards to your operating systems so like linux mac or windows uh i mean i've been mac for a long time so mac okay okay that's good to know and then <laughs> do you prefer like uh dedicated pc or you you stick to like laptops for that portability oh good question um i mean i've been laptop for quite some time but i'm mm -hmm. considering buying a mac mini um in the next mm -hmm. couple of months so moving to like a desktop um nice. mainly because i do generally try to do a lot of my work just at my actual workspace mm -hmm. i just find it healthier just to so maybe it might be desktop in the future but it's been laptop so far 
Okay. Oh, that's good to know. And then we, I think we already know the answer to this, but um, <laughs> like, what's your, what's your favorite top most programming language? Oh, okay. So my background is obviously JS, but mm -hmm. I've actually been playing a lot around with Golang recently and I actually really like it. Um, and I'm thinking to kind of switch my, I guess my specialty over the mm -hmm. next year or two actually into Golang rather than okay. JavaScript. It just plays better with some of the stuff that I want to do in the future with cloud. And okay. yeah, there's pros and cons. It's a, it's a bit more of a verbose language, um, mm -hmm. but there's aspects to it that I really enjoy uh, that I don't necessarily enjoy from, from the JS ecosystem and stuff like that. Like philosophically, I don't know how much you know, but like in the JS ecosystem, obviously it's a meme that there's a new framework every five minutes, yeah. but like in the go space, uh, it's interesting philosophically, they've decided mm -hmm. to not extend the language, um, okay. unless mm -hmm. there's a good reason. So yep. it's almost like they're saying, look, we want it to be stable and yeah, maybe your syntax might be slightly verbose here and there, but like. We're not going to give you five ways to do the same thing. Mm. We're going to try and give you one way. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And after being on the treadmill of the, the JS world for so long, yeah. you hear someone say like, oh, yeah, we're going to try and keep it stable. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, with so many things to look into and learn, you're like, oh, okay, cool. One less thing to look into. Yeah. That sounds neat. Um, so yeah. And it gets overwhelming, especially for beginners out there with JS. Like, oh, what? There's like five frameworks that I can choose. <laughs> It's overwhelming for me. It's yeah. been like nearly 10 years of JS now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm super overwhelmed still. <laughs> so, Oh, that's interesting. So yeah, I guess now that you have mentioned Golang, uh, right after this call, I have to go and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the things that I struggle with. And I think we kind of already know the answer to this too, but favorite, kind of favorite cloud right now so AWS, azure gcp and there are a million others so like digital ocean <laughs> oh yeah tough one um well the thing is my my background's in aws so yeah uh, yeah like I, I wish i've played more with some of the other clouds and my intention is mm -hmm. to play a bit more um especially around with, uh, for some reason i kind of find myself drawn to gcp uh, i've done some stuff in azure as well through work and things like that but um mm -hmm. aws has been sort of my staple um throughout time so yeah i'd probably go with that okay Unless i'm trying to think i'm trying to think of uh alternatives like the smaller niche ones i don't know you got like the serverless cloud coming out now as well yeah it's gonna get yeah. it's gonna get a bit more niche but uh no for sure but, yeah um yeah no i think i think that is we are like moving towards the end of the episode here and it was really it was really um uh, nice to discuss like the insights of your career and get to know you better and i think this is a f yeah we, we have known each other on twitter for a while now we have been like exchanging messages and stuff um we even have talked on discord but we haven't really met like face to face even though it's over uh <laughs> a video call but no it was it was really nice um finally catching up with you um do you have any tip or any suggestion um for the audience while we like move towards the end and wrap this up uh no not necessarily i mean if people want to sort of follow some of my stuff open up the cloud.com obviously is the, the blog and you can find a lot of other stuff from that one thing that i suppose i didn't mention as well is with the open up the cloud stuff that i'm doing is i'm trying to run it as uh basically like a social enterprise so any money that i'm earning from open up the cloud is basically going back into the community which is quite cool so Sort of any support that you give for me, I'm doing best to then just give that away, um, which has been cool. So over the last year, we've kind of been able to give away um, some certifications to people that probably couldn't afford it before, and um, you nice. know, sponsor some people as well that are doing doing good work and stuff like that. But yeah, if and then if anyone has any questions or stuff, you know, reach out to me. I, I love answering people's questions and doing my yep. best to help out as well. Um, but yeah, and it, yeah, man. your yeah, I'll I'll make sure to have all your socials in the in the description too. But yeah, you <laughs> can so many nowadays. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I yeah. see. I try to keep them down. For me, it's always uh, like Twitter and maybe sometimes LinkedIn. Um, yeah, but yeah, other than that, I yeah, I can't just yeah. keep up with it. <laughs> multiple you're, 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 I've seen you quite big on the LinkedIn. Uh, I haven't got there yet. I yeah. 
it's, it's too yeah. much already. I do quite a lot on Twitter and I do a bit on Instagram actually nowadays as well. Oh, okay. But, yeah. I jumped the bullet on Instagram, I think like two years ago and I'm like, I'm fine. Like nothing has changed <laughs> since then. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't want to take on a different segue towards the end, but yeah, Instagram's funny for tech. It's, it's mm -hmm. a bit weird, but one thing is I found that I get quite a lot of interactions and, and, and people are quite willing to chat and stuff on there, which for me is the big thing with the social media. I just want to talk to people. I want to get the engagement. I want to, you know, nice. see reactions to different stuff that I'm putting out. Um, no, for sure. But yeah. But it's, it's a weird one with, uh, yeah, because it's the TikTok is kind of making yeah. its way into yeah. Instagram and all, all the dancing. And yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird place. <laughs> no, for sure. But yeah, I think, no, it was, it was really insightful and there was some really good um, tips uh, within our conversations about your career here and all those funny horror stories. Now we <laughs> look back at those and laugh. But yeah, no, it was really nice to have you. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll keep in touch for sure. And watch out for Open Up the Cloud. And you can follow Lo on Twitter. And he also has some videos coming in uh, on his YouTube. So look yes, out for of those. Yes, of course, of course. But Amazing. Yeah. Thanks, Rishabh. I really appreciate it. It's been good fun. No, it was, it was really great to have you.